Who remembers the good old house call days? Some may imagine a doctor strolling into their home with a well-worn briefcase and curled-up stethoscope. This decades-old site of healthcare became problematic because physicians can't exactly stuff intricate equipment or instruments into a bag anymore. However, newer technologies are making the house call a thing again. Advances in home health grant many options for patients unable to get to the clinic. Patients must know the uses and limits of home health to better take care of themselves when it's necessary for medicine to go to them rather than the other way around. After this episode, you'll see why healthcare from home is making a comeback. Your well-being should be about thriving instead of surviving. It's about time to empower yourself and to navigate our healthcare system with ease. My name is Rishi and this is the show, Friendly Neighborhood Patient. Medicine at home is a wide umbrella. You might have finished a major surgery and need close follow-up after the hospital. Maybe you have a serious condition that requires a professional's repeated presence coming to you. The point is that you can't move easily out of the house to seek care or it's just hard to follow instructions outside of your home. House calls in the 1900s involved a visiting doctor treating a targeted issue. Let's just say you had something like a severe cough. The doctor comes in, offers diagnosis and treatment, leaves, and that's usually it. A joint review by Johns Hopkins and the University of Arizona's geriatric departments noted that house calls used to be about 40% of all medical visits in the 1930s, before falling to about 0.6% by 1980. Tech limitations, fear of liability, and low payouts for Medicare drove that change. But now, the rise of home-based primary care, or HBPC, is reversing that result. HBPC's strategy is to care for a homebound patient over time, besides treating acute or intermittent problems. Medicare revised several fees in the late 90s, promoting home health usage to cut hospital readmissions. These changes were a small part of Medicare's priority shift from volume to value-based care. The VA is a simple example. Their HBPC program oversees around 60,000 veterans. Should home health care be limited to the elderly and disabled? Because of electronic medical records, new portable testing devices, and telemedicine, it's now more feasible for patients to get care from home, and not just those who are elderly. Patients aren't the only staff coming to your door. A whole team of nurses, social workers, and other practitioners get involved. The many forms of home health range from traditional house calls to medication applications and therapy sessions. Some may claim that with all these services, we don't really need to go out for medicine anymore. Although that statement is definitely false because it's a bit hard to do a heart surgery at home, for example, there is some truth in providers being able to learn subtle things when visiting your turf versus the clinic where it's easy for you to be guarded. One point of confusion for patients is the difference between home health and home care. Home health just refers to the medical side of diagnosing and treating illnesses. Home care assistance involves daily needs such as bathing, feeding, and clothing. Both of these services are great tools for patients, but eligibility through Medicare can be challenging. From the perspective of government insurance coverage, saving money is the highest priority. Home health is no exception. Since the majority of patients needing home health are 65+, plus, Medicare's rules are the primary driver of home health's comeback. Seniors trying to get home health care need to pass a number of criteria to get coverage. The main requirements involve a doctor's certification of the patient being homebound, the need for intermittent but not around-the-clock care, and review periods every 30 days to make sure things are progressing smoothly. Even with Medicare's prior approval, some benefits like 24-hour care, meal delivery, and home care won't be covered. Agencies certified by Medicare can bill patients directly for those services Medicare doesn't pay for. Patients must receive an advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage, or ABN, before that happens. I'll link Medicare's home health rulebook and other sources in this post on my page at rushinagala.substack.com. Home health changes whether you get it from a hospital or freestanding agency. Hospitals can have a contract with a home health agency, though, to assist you after a major procedure or stay. You or a loved one may be living with an issue where an independent firm can also assist for a number of 30-day periods. Some companies, like Landmark Health, do the primary care and chronic disease management for their patients and, in turn, take on that separate financial risk. The choices can be overwhelming, even with Medicare's and other insurance companies' requirements. 
it's a great idea to consult your primary doctor as the first step to narrow down options. When you're making the final choice for the out-home care team, make sure to ask what the covered and non-covered fees are. Having the doctor visit you is great, but why is home health relevant again? New technology enables remote and home care, but it's not really the catalyst. The home of the new home health and HBPC movement is cost savings, like I mentioned earlier. Medicare and other insurance companies pay out large benefits to hospitals, which have, in some cases, a small number of patients taking up an outsized amount of time and money. Think of the 80-20 rule here. These parties all want to avoid readmissions whenever possible. Home health is a tool to achieve those savings. This sounds wonderful on its face. Yet home health isn't as cost-effective as advertised. To be fair, the jury is still out on this reality, but patients must know the incentives at play. Home health contributed to 7% of 2019's national health expenditure growth and 9.5% of 2020's. This is second only to nursing care facilities' 13% contribution in 2020. According to CMS, home health expenses are expected to rise 73% from 2020 to 2028. Those dollars, going from $116 billion to $201 billion, have about a 6% annual growth rate versus the 5.4% national average growth rate for all other costs. Keep in mind that homebound seniors on the OG Medicare, meaning parts A and B, are in the single-digit millions. This could be anywhere between 3 and 6 million people. If hospitals and clinics are understaffed as they are today, who's going to have time to see patients at home? And the higher usage of that precious hospital space pushes excess healthcare demand to other places such as skilled nursing facilities and traditional outpatient clinics. Only the most expensive patients with serious conditions in need of multiple treatments who can't leave the house are the ones getting the home care and home health. Nationwide aging doesn't help either. This is why Medicare has strict requirements to actually approve home health. Regardless of who sponsors the care, the aim is to corral medical expenses by the elderly and make profits from those savings rather than create new value for those people and others. But what if we turn the concept of home health on its head once more? Sprinkling in preventative health approaches can help us redefine the Americans most at risk long term. It's worth asking if people under 65, besides those having severe neuromuscular issues, with predispositions for widespread chronic diseases like diabetes and obesity, can get home health care, even if they can move around unassisted. Expanded but thorough permissions can help such patients get started earlier on necessary care in the comfort of their own home. This can prevent both hospitalizations and unnecessary visits to the clinic, which also achieves better cost savings. Private, home health agencies may have to assume these risks before the government is willing to. Health plans can also pilot more dedicated HBPC networks and strengthen relationships with doctors of certain regions. Implementing technology to approve or deny home health requests, referrals, or authorizations smoothly will be necessary as well. These changes, all of which have a better shot at benefiting patients than our current status quo, are in part up to policymakers but private industry can certainly take the risks first. All patients can still make their voices heard, though, by their local governments and medical providers to move change along. Regardless of whether medical care happens at home, online, or in the clinic, you're probably getting a prescription for something during your lifetime. Then you'll need to either go to the pharmacy or get mail-ordered medications. The next pod's theme is going to help you tackle all the pharmacies out there with confidence. Stay tuned and subscribe to Friendly Neighborhood Patient for all the medical world guides you need. I'll catch you the next episode.